was a movie released by the title Black Hawk Down. Well, you may or may not be familiar with the movie. I'll give you a short summary of the plot. There, were two, there was a, a unit of army rangers who were sent into Somalia to extract a couple of political figures. Well, by the title of the movie, two Black Hawk helicopters were shot down, which took this short extraction mission to, from one hour to 22 hours. Now, ending in 19, the death of 19 Americans and 1,000 Somali militia members. Now, as you hear this, you may think to yourself, well, what does this have to do with Memorial Day? What does this have to do with church? Well, this is actually based on a true story. It was based on a book before, after, and, and then made into a movie. Some political agenda included, but they were trying to capture that message. Now, I don't know about you. I've never fought in any wars. I've never been part of the military. I've never really been involved in any kind of ROTC programs. But I enjoy war movies. I enjoy war movies, not because of the blood and guts, not because of the death. I mean, we don't need to turn on a movie to know that war is deadly. We don't need to turn on a movie to know that death comes when people are in conflict. But what I like about war movies is they try, in, in, in order to keep the length going, is they show those different aspects of strategy. Just think about the war movies you've seen. Even if you haven't seen Black Hawk Down, you maybe have seen another movie where they have gone through those st various strategies to carry out uh, the mission that was at hand. You know that they had to work together. People had to come together who were from different backgrounds, different ethnicities. They had to work together to come to victory. And so I enjoy that about these war movies. Now, some of them end in happy endings. Some of them end in sad endings. Truth be told, I enjoy the ones that end with the happy endings more so than the sad endings, but the, probably the sad endings are more, more realistic. Again, though, I wanted to focus in on one particular aspect. And there's a certain motto of the Rangers, and this is the subtitle of the movie. No man left behind. And this, many of us do not know where this comes from. We think that when we talk about the military, well, this is something that's familiar. When we think about the, the armed forces, we know that this is something that seems to be part of them. But from the time on, from the beginning of time on, we, we just see that these soldiers come together. Now, some people have said, well, it's part of the Rangers' training because it's part of their creed, which says, I will never leave a fallen comrade to fall into the hands of the enemy, and under no circumstances will I ever embarrass my country. And that's just the very end of their creed. But it reminds us of that commitment that they have, that loyalty that they have. All of us understand those ideas of commitment and loyalty. We understand whether or not we've served in the armed forces that a soldier, that he or she puts their lives on the line for someone they don't even know. That they put their lives on the line for a brother, for a sister in battle. But they also put their lives on the line for each one of us. And so... On days like today, on weekends like this weekend, we celebrate and we honor those soldiers with Memorial Day or Veterans Day. But you're probably thinking, well, these are federal holidays. What do these have to do with us other than that we can worship together in freedom and thank the Lord that we can, that we can join together and we can lift up voices in song, that we can join together and we can hear the word preach. But what else does it have to do? Well, I'd like to draw your attention back to that phrase, no one no man left behind, or no one left behind. In the military, they understand this concept. They understand the importance of taking care of one another. They understand the necessity of working together. But what about us in the church? What about us? Do we understand the importance of taking care of one another? Do we understand the importance of caring for one another, of being there for one another, of having that same level of loyal and commitment to one another? Do we understand how important it is for us to look after the needs of our brothers and sisters? What is interesting to me is it seems like the military, that they ingrain this in the soldiers. But uh, for us in the church, many times this goes as a, well, to the wayside. Taking care of others seems to be become a, an extension of us, a separation from us. It doesn't seem to be part of us, the part of our need as a Christian people. Tell me if I'm wrong. In your, in your life, in our lives, do we always take time to take care of others? Do we always take time to step out and 
sacrifice ourselves, humble ourselves to take care of others. I know for me, I imagine for some of you at times that you're more concerned with taking care of yourself. You've had a long day. You've had a busy week. You've had a schedule that's overflowing, and so you need to take care of number one. But this is not God's design. This is not how God had it in mind, is it? Just consider from the very beginning, God didn't create individuals alone. He didn't didn't create man by himself, but he said it is not good for man to be alone. So he put man and woman together for companionship. Consider your family life. Did God just create you by yourself? No. You have a network of, of family, even if they're not related by blood. Those who take care of you, those who offer you support when you're in trouble, those who you can talk to when you need advice. And beyond that, our Lord gives us our church family. He gives us those in our congregation who we share with and support one another with. So that when we are going through the trials and temptations of our lives, we can rely on one another. When we struggle with the burdens that we have of our day-to-day lives, we can rely on those who are sitting next to us in the pews, those who are members with us in the body of Christ, those who may not go to this church but may go to another church who believe in Jesus as their Savior. Hear Paul's words from, to the Thessalonians. Words of encouragement, words to them. Therefore, encourage one another. Build one another up, just as in fact you are doing. Paul's encouragement to them, but it doesn't stop there. In fact, that word, one another, alelon, is a Greek word used over a hundred times in the Greek New Testament. Alelon. You don't have to be a Greek or a Hebrew scholar to know that if Christ uses a word, or if if, God uses a word in Scripture over a hundred times, then there's important. And that's just in the New Testament. That's approximately four times per book of the New Testament, not including the Old Testament, where we have that one another, that relationship with one another encouraged. See, that relationship with one another is an important aspect of our Christian faith. So often we think it's just me and God. It's my responsibility before God. It's what I need to do before God. But it's not just me and God. Now, our faith cannot save someone else. Our faith cannot bring redemption to someone else. But that doesn't mean that we go this road alone, that we're lonely. Because when we try to take it on our own, when we try to focus on just ourselves and the importance of our faith, we kind of lose sight of the path. We lose sight of the journey that Christ is sending us on. And when we start on that path, what happens? We become, first off, egotistical, conceited. Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. When we are focused on ourselves, focused on our path to God alone, not seeing the importance of supporting one another, we miss out on the needs that other people have. We miss out on the opportunities we have to serve and share with others. And also, keep in mind that when we are so focused on ourselves, it's hard for Christ to work through us to be a blessing to others. Think about your own lives. Think about how hard it is to put someone else first. How hard it is to, put, to, to help someone else when all you can think about is yourself. I should admit, about three weeks ago, three and a half weeks ago, I had a, I wouldn't say rude awakening, but a a very eye-opening experience to putting others first. When Jacob entered into our lives, suddenly it didn't become all about what I needed right away, if I was thirsty or if I was hungry, even if I had to use the bathroom. Instead, it became, you know, Jacob is crying, he needs to be burped, he needs to be fed, he needs to be put down, he needs his diaper changed. All of a sudden, and many of you know this, well, you've raised kids or you've taken care of people, haven't you? You know what it's like that all of a sudden when you, put, when you have to put someone else first. But think about it if you would never, if you are so focused on yourself. How could you put someone else first? It's nearly impossible, isn't it? See, Satan knows another valuable military strategy that is divide and conquer. 
It seems to make sense for us, even for those of us who have not ever been in the military, we know, divide and conquer. It makes it easier. Perhaps many of you have to think back a few years, but think about when you were a young child, or if it wasn't so long ago. But think about, what if mom or dad said no? What did you do? I learned very quickly that I didn't go to the other parent. But the very first thing is you try to do is go to the other parent. You try to get them on your side, if you will. Well, that is exactly what Satan does. Except it's not so funny when Satan does it. Because what Satan does is he builds up these wedges and barriers between us. He builds up these divisions between us as Christians so that we do not support one another. He knows that it's much easier to attack us, much easier to lead us to depression, much easier to lead us away from God when he drives those wedges between us. And he doesn't just do it in our church family, but he does it in our homes. He does it in our school. He does it in our jobs. He does it in, well, wherever he has the chance. Think about it. Even as Christians, that divorce rate is just about exactly the same as the divorce rate in a non-Christian home. Satan tears husband from wife, wife from husband. He divides that relationship so that they focus not on, on God, but on themselves. Satan divides the families. Sons against fathers. Daughters against mothers. Grandparents against grandchildren. Brothers against sisters. He puts those wedges there so that we spend time fighting, spend time bickering, spend time focused on trying to solve those instead of focusing on the strength that comes in faith. It's not just in our homes. It's not just in our families that these divisions come, is it either? In schools, it used to be that it, there was teasing. It used to be that there were maybe scuffles. Well, now it's gone on to the point that instead of a teasing or a scuffle, words or fist, a student brings a gun to school. Well, they teased me. They hurt my feelings. See, it's not like it's just something that's, well, Pastor, you're exaggerating. It's not just something where it's, we don't have to worry about it. It's something that's very real, that's very much affecting our lives. Very much these divisions that come. They don't drive us away from those, those things which God has intended for us to do. Those things, those battles that God has prepared for us against Satan. That he has been preparing our hearts for, to work together. And ultimately, Satan attacks our churches. He attacks us right where we're meant to find strength. He attacks us right where we're intended to find that, that mutual upbuilding with fellow believers, doesn't he? He does it in sinister little ways, too. He doesn't outright say, you know, you're a non-believer and lead us away from the faith. But he puts us, pits us against one another. He gives us this us-versus-them attitude. You've heard of this before, maybe not in those words, but this us-versus-them attitude. Well, they voted for that. They voted for that. And we separate ourselves, two sides. When in reality, the ministry of God, the ministry of the church, is one people. And why does Satan do this? Why does Satan divide us in our families, in our schools, in our jobs, in our homes? Why does he divide us in our churches? Because ultimately he wants to divide us from the hope of salvation. Ultimately he wants to drive a wedge between us and God that is so thick that we have no chance of approaching him. He wants to divide us from God so that we don't even look to God for help, for strength, for support. He wants to divide us from God so that sin and temptation rule our lives. And then once he has that division formed, he starts to whisper in our ear. He starts to say things in our hearts like, you don't deserve to go to church. You don't deserve to have the mercy of God. He starts to say things to us like, think of how many times you have sinned. How many times have you broken God's law? How many times have you hurt a brother or sister in Christ? How many times have you failed to keep God's law perfectly? He just, he beats us up. He beats us up until we just feel that we can't even approach God. That we don't even have a right to come to near Him. That we look at the altar and we see that sacrament and we say, that's 
that's, I, I can't take that. I'm not re- ready for that. Not one of us has gone through this life without experiencing the attacks of Satan, have we? Not one of us have gone through this light, this life, without feeling the hatred and the pain of Satan. Not even Christ himself has come through this life unscathed. Certainly he has never given over to sin. Certainly he has never broken God's law. But that did not mean his life did not go unscathed. In fact, I would say more than the rest of us, Christ Jesus experienced the scathing pain of Satan. The scathing pain of hatred. The wickedness. That division, that, that, the, those divisions of Satan. That divided him, Christ from his friends, from his family, from his loved ones. And ultimately, that division that sent him to the cross by himself, without even the Father there, but in the cross, in the cross was victory. In the cross was not final defeat. Paul says in Romans, you see, at just the right time, when we were yet powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates His own love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Greater love has no one, no man than this, than someone lay down his life for his friend. Christ has called us His friend. He has experienced the scathing attacks of Satan. He has experienced the, the, uh, the rejection of us, the rejection of his loved ones, his family, his friends. But he went to the cross anyhow. He went to the cross and he gave his life. He went to the cross and he paid the price so that we could be his friends, so that we would not merely be servants, so that we would not merely be followers, but we would be his followers, his children. His sons and daughters. He went to the cross so that we would be more than followers, but that we would be friends. Did you hear His words of adoption to us? I chose you. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my Father. I have made known to you. You didn't choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit. Fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command. Love each other. Christ Jesus, our true friend. Christ Jesus, our one and only friend who has never failed us. Christ Jesus, our friend who showed us the greatest act of love. Has chosen us. Has chosen us to live as His people to live lives that honor Him, that live lives that praise Him. Now, of course, we know that we will fail. Time and again, we are sinners who break God's law. Time and again, even though we are redeemed, we will not bear this good fruit. But that is why it is not on us. That is why it is not our responsibility. Because we could not fill that responsibility, but it is Christ. Christ who never forgot us. Christ who is that good friend to us. But as redeemed children of God, we do go forth to bear these fruits. We do go forth with that message of hope, that message of the gospel, that message of victory against Satan. See, that the battlefield is still drawn. Satan is still against us. Well, we may not fight physical battles. We do constantly fight that spiritual battle. But we go forth under one banner. We go forth under one cross. We go forth as one people against the powers of Satan. And how do we prepare? We prepare with prayer. First off, we prepare by praying that the Lord would give us forgiveness. We prepare by praying that He would forgive us for those times when we've been self-centered, we're self-focused. We pray that He would grant us the strength to go forth. Second, we pray for His guidance. That He would show us those in need. Those who need our help. Those who need our support. Third, we pray that He would break down those barriers because we know that we can't break down those barriers, can we? All of us have experienced those barriers that separate us from family members, from friends and loved ones. And it is only the power of Christ that can destroy those barriers. 
is only the power of Christ that can be that wrecking ball that knocks down those concrete barriers that are between us. Fourth, we pray that God will give us the strength to pray for our enemies. To pray for those who we, who, who we believe are against us. To pray for those who we don't think that we could ever reconcile with. And fifth, we pray. We pray that even as sinful followers of Christ, that His Word may may ever be the guide for our lives. That His Word may ever be the light to our path. That His Word may ever give us strength to know the truth. Now as often, as often as we are divided, we know that we have our Lord and Savior in common. We know that we have His power and His might. Paul writes these words of encouragement. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. We do have that same purpose. We do have that same like-minded attitude. And that is the battle. The battle against Satan. That is the battle that we fight each and every day that we do not do alone but we do with the help and support of our brothers and sisters. And I encourage you, if you do not have someone who you confide in, if you do not have someone that you look to support to, that helps bring you to faith, that, to lead you to the cross, to Christ, if you try to face these battles in life alone, I encourage you to heed the words of, Christ, of Scripture. Those words of Christ, to live with one another, to offer the mutual support and upbuilding, Ultimately, that is why we join together. We join together in worship and praise in church, but we also join together to support one another. And I encourage you, each day, to support one another. To support each other in the faith. To support each other in asking for forgiveness. To support each other in coming to the Lord's altar for, for His strength through the Lord's Supper. And to support each other in knowing the hope of salvation. Thanks be to God. We do not fight this battle alone, but the battle is the Lord's. That battle has been won, and we know that victory has gone to Christ. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for those who have given their lives for us, for those who have sacrificed their lives in battle, those who have sacrificed their lives in spiritual battle, and those who have sacrificed their lives in physical battles on this earth. But most of all, we thank you for sacrificing your life. Because it is by your life that we have the hope of salvation. It is by your life that we have the hope of a resurrection on the last day. It is by your life that we look forward to one day when we will not fight this battle against Satan. When we will no longer be mired in temptation and sin. But we will be in your presence. Lord, until that day, we pray your strength upon us. We pray your guidance in our hearts. We pray that you would fill us with hope, knowing that we are your children. We pray that you would break down the barriers that divide us. Break down the barriers that divide us from one another in this church. The barriers that divide us from other churches. That we may go forth into battle, fighting the good fight, as Paul has told us. Fighting against Satan, looking forward to the victory feast, which has no end. O Lord, may we ever look to your cross. And know our salvation is sure. In Jesus' holy and precious name we pray. Amen.